from the studios of the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication in downtown Phoenix. This is Cronkite News. Election Day is upon us, and as Arizonans finish casting their votes, we look at how turnout can affect this midterm election. And we continue our Access Across Arizona initiative, traveling to Pinal County to find out how a teacher shortage is broadening the search for qualified instructors. Plus, a Cronkite News investigation into the dangers of heroin in Arizona leads to a discovery of the gateway drugs that could be in your medicine cabinet. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to this special Vote 2014 edition of Cronkite News. I'm Annalise Ortiz. And I'm Brittany Bade. Thanks for joining us. Election Day is finally here and Cronkite News has team coverage across the state to keep you updated on what happens once the polls close tonight. Cronkite News reporters will be stationed at Republican and Democratic watch parties in downtown Phoenix and Tucson to get results and reactions. We'll start with Yahira Jaquez, who will be tracking developments at the Democratic watch party from the Renaissance Hotel in downtown Phoenix. Tonight, we expect to see Democratic candidates and their supporters here at the watch party, including gubernatorial candidate Fred Duvall, who is hoping to become the first Democrat in the governor's office since Janet Napolitano left office in 2009. Earlier today, I caught up with Duvall as he cast his vote at his precinct at 7th Avenue and Glendale. With campaigning coming to an end, he stressed the importance of voting and said tonight's winner will have a huge job ahead to change Arizona's future for the better. Arizona's headed in the wrong direction, and uh, we, you know our economy is not uh, working the way it should, and our K-12 system has been badly hurt. And elections is when uh, we all get to make a decision to go in a different direction, and uh, today I believe we will do so. Duvall did say he is expecting to be here at the Democratic watch party tonight, but he hasn't set an exact time for his appearance. But there will be plenty of other races for Democrats to keep their eye on tonight, including Superintendent of Public Instruction, Attorney General, and Secretary of State. But meanwhile, my colleague Megan Guthrie is keeping track of events at the Republican watch party across the street. Megan? Well, the Hyatt in downtown Phoenix is the home of the GOP watch party. And like his Democratic counterpart, Republican gubernatorial candidate Doug Ducey made sure to cast his vote today, all with his family by his side. The Duceys came out to Ascension Lutheran Church in Paradise Valley early this afternoon. For Ducey, it was an opportunity to make his voice count, and he is looking forward to the results. We feel excited, we feel anxious, and uh, I'm ready to see the results. But we couldn't have worked harder. We had great volunteers all over the state and every county. We had wonderful people speaking out on our behalf. Of course, Arizona suffered low voter turnout for the primary back in August, but with some big statewide races and neck and neck congressional contests, many are hopeful that more Arizonans will go out and cast their vote for the midterm election today. Some made their way to the polls before the sun came up. Well, bright and early, we got up to go enjoy a bagel and come and vote. We like to come in the morning early to get our sticker and try to encourage other people to come out and vote. Others voted by mail. My wife and I like to do the mail-in ballots, so uh, we're on the permanent early voter list. Today is the last chance for Arizonans to cast their ballots for the midterm. In August, only 27% of registered voters cast a ballot for the primary. This doesn't make sense to me. How would you, why would you not vote? And without a presidential or U.S. Senate race, this year's midterm results may not be much higher. Since we don't have a U.S. Senate race on the ballot this year, uh, I think we'll probably, unfortunately, be just a little bit below the 55% we were four years ago. So I'm kind of expecting 50 to 55% turnout. Each voter must show identification and make sure to sign their ballots at the polls. Regardless of your political party, Arizonans are encouraged to make their voice count. We've had a lot of races decided by less than one-tenth of one percent. So when you think about, you know, that can be just a handful of people that make the decision one way or the other. It is the final hours to see just how Arizonans will vote. 
Now, if you're wanting to cast a ballot, remember you have until 7 p.m. tonight for the polls to be open. Live at the GOP Watch Party, Megan Guthrie, Cronkite News. While overall voter turnout is expected to be down, at least one group is expecting a higher showing than the 2010 midterms. Cronkite News reporter Stephen Hicks is in our Washington bureau with the impact this demographic can have. Stephen? Thanks, Annalise. Ya es hora de y bota. In English, it's time, go and vote. That's the rallying cry from the National Association of Latino elected and appointed officials who have been working all year trying to get Latino vote, Latinos to the polls. Today, they're working hard to make sure there are no problems there. The nonprofit organization is hosting a hotline for voter protection, as well as telling voters where and what they need to bring to get out and vote. In Arizona, registered Latino voters make up 20% of the total electorate, a sizable enough population to make an impact on the outcome of several close races, including the governor's race and the races in congressional districts two and nine. Latinos do have, uh, they're gonna have a say if they show up at the polls at who's gonna uh, end up winning. The question is, if they get to the polls. Maristani has heard that Latino voters, like many across the country, are upset with Congress's inaction on immigration reform and may be too frustrated to even vote. We hope that, in fact, it's going to be the opposite and that more Latinos are going to vote because they're not happy with the current situation. She said the main question she's been getting is whether her group's projection of 7.8 million voters is accurate when compared to the 6.6 .6 million that voted in the 2010 midterms. Just by the sheer growth in the population, you're going to get a growth in the number of Latinos that are going to go to the polls. While the number of Latino vote, voters may be up, one thing that's not expected to change, Hispanics still favoring Democrats. A new poll today showed that of those registered to vote, 36% are likely going to vote uh, in support of the Democratic candidate compared to just 14% for the Republican. Live in Washington, D.C., Stephen Hicks, Cronkite News. To combat fraud at the polls, several states require proof of citizenship. But as L. Johns reports, some wonder if this is changing the outcome of the races. Here in Arizona, an ID is required to register to vote in local elections. If they don't prove their citizenship to us, we can't allow them to vote except on the federal offices. But since its inception a decade ago, the number of registered voters in Arizona without proof of citizenship has been whittled down dramatically. I mean, we may have started out, and I believe, if I recall, the figure that comes to mind is about 30,000 people that we originally started out with in this category. We're down to in the hundreds now of people who actually haven't provided us with that proof of citizenship. That requirement to show your ID could be keeping people from the polls. Studies have been, have been conducted that show that if we did away with voter registration as a requirement for even voting, that you would increase voter turnout probably by about 5%. Herrera says one of the possible motivations for requiring proof of citizenship could be politically charged. African American voters, Latino voters are more likely to vote for Democrats than they are Republicans, right? So it may be disproportionately affecting, in effect, what would be Democratic voters. But it's not just Democrats who may be suffering. Elderly voters may be more likely to vote for Republicans. And so across the board, it's hard to tell um, who might be more disadvantaged. But we do know that certain groups are less likely to be able to bear the costs represented by photo ID. The ASU professor believes the number of people not voting could be enough to change the outcome of the races. So if you think about a lot of elections, 5% can actually make a huge difference. But Purcell disagrees it would have a real impact. If we look at the number of people who are in that category that we know are what we call our federal voters, it's a very small number. So I don't anticipate that that is going to be a real issue. In Phoenix, L. Johns, Cronkite News. Recently, a U.S. district court ruled that requiring IDs in Texas amounted to a poll tax, but that decision is under appeal. And we'll have more election coverage later on Cronkite News. But coming up next, we continue our Access Across Arizona coverage in Pinal County, where school officials are looking beyond borders to educate their students. And a Cronkite News investigation, how over... Uh, prescription drugs can have more dangerous side effects than you might think. 
with in-depth analysis with veteran journalist Ted Simons on Arizona Horizon and live reports from the award-winning Cronkite News team. Arizona Horizon and Cronkite News have Vote 2014 Election Night covered on Arizona PBS. It all starts on 8HD with Cronkite News at 5, followed by Arizona Horizon at 5.30. Then tune in to 8 World from 8 to 10 for more Cronkite News, including live election returns and voter reaction from the polls. Then join Ted Simons at 10 for live results analysis and meaningful discussion on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon and Cronkite News. It's election night on Arizona PBS. Tonight at 5 on 8HD. Reaching Arizona's communities uncovered by mainstream media. Discovering the untold stories of our state's women, men, children, and change makers. We're taking a look at what's making news across Arizona. This is the Cronkite News Initiative, Access Across Arizona. Live coverage of topics that matter and people who make a difference. Delivered to the homes of Arizona PBS viewers like you. Access Across Arizona is made possible by women and philanthropy. Cronkite News brings you Access Across Arizona. Welcome back to Cronkite News and our initiative to access communities across Arizona. The scarcity of qualified teachers in Arizona has some public school districts scrambling to fill the openings. Our Cronkite News team went to Pinal County and found that the Casa Grande Union High School District was one of those districts that had to recruit teachers from elsewhere. Reporter Angeli Meehan joins us live from Casa Grande with the details. Angeli. In the state of Arizona, there are more than 1,300 openings for elementary and secondary teachers. These positions are often difficult to fill and to retain. So difficult that one high school district here in Pinal County had to recruit teachers from as far away as the Philippines. Very good. That's the nucleus. Okay. Chemistry teacher Maria Dulce Palomares is prepared for the Arizona heat. I'm bringing some protective, <laughs> some protective gear so as not to feel really hot, but it's good that it, in the classroom it's air conditioned. However, Palomares didn't come to Casa Grande from the Philippines for the climate. Arizona ranks low in the amount of state funding it gives to public education. It's a contributing factor in the state's current teacher shortage. Dr. Shannon Goodsell knows this quite well as superintendent of Casa Grande Union High School District. It makes it very difficult for us to both attract and to maintain our current teaching force simply because of the structure of our salary schedule scale. We do the best we can. He had 19 teacher vacancies at the end of last school year and not one applicant. The high school district searched locally and nationally for qualified teachers to fill the openings. They were able to hire a few educators from Pennsylvania. However, the superintendent still needed more teachers. But that still did not fill all of the positions that we had in the district. So then our last and final step was to look internationally. They contacted an agency that linked the school district to a list of qualified international teachers. After watching YouTube videos of different teachers in action and conducting numerous Skype interviews, Dr. Goodsell selected 11 math and science teachers from the Philippines. Maria Dulce Palamares was one of the 11 teachers hired for the current school year. She acknowledges the importance of participation in the classroom. Well, it has to be um, interactive. You need to engage your students a lot. And so every time I'm, I teach, I'm always planning ahead of time. And I, I, I have to know that most of my students would really participate. Casa Grande Union High School District's teaching positions are now filled. The district has also hired long-term substitute teachers waiting on testing to become licensed teachers. I'm here with Casa Grande Union High School District Governing Board Member Ed, Ed Barber. Ed, thanks again for taking the time to, t to speak with us. So why, so why is it so hard to maintain and attract teachers in the Arizona public school system? The salaries that can be afforded to teachers are really based upon the, what the legislature allows us or provides us in funds. So that makes it really difficult. Okay, and then, so, so, um, what, what, um, what, so, so, live from Casa Grande, Angeli Meehan, Cronkite News. 
Thanks for that, Anjali. Our Cronkite News investigative team is exposing heroin's tightening grip on Arizona as part of a months long project. And tonight we're learning new details about prescription medications becoming a gateway to heroin use. Our I team reporter Vivian Padilla gives us a candid look at the numbers behind this growing threat to our youth. By the time former state legislator Doris Goodale realized her daughter was addicted to pain pills. It was too late then. We had already wandered off into this black world. Like many addicts, her daughter Stephanie became dependent after a string of painful medical problems. People go, how could you not know? Well, kids don't do drugs in front of their family. It's not like at breakfast, hey, mom, we're going to have drugs and cornflakes today. Goodale believes doctors don't take enough responsibility for prescribing dangerous narcotics that can lead to addiction. One of the key elements of the, the medical system in this country is that physicians are gatekeepers. They provide a very important service for us in, in regulating and limiting access to controlled substances. The Cronkite News investigative team wanted to know just how many doctors are disciplined for inappropriate prescribing. We found since September 2012, at least 28 medical professionals in Arizona have been reprimanded by the state board for over prescribing narcotics. For a month, Cronkite News made calls and left messages for the Arizona Medical Board seeking comment or an on-camera interview. However, our calls were not returned. And for state lawmaker and former ER doctor Eric Meyer, the board plays an important role. To look at who's getting these drugs and how often um, so that we could at the prescriber level begin to um, control the number of drugs that are given. Here's another problem. On the street, a single pill can cost around 40 to $80. For an addict, the high price can lead them in another dangerous direction. Oxycodone is the big drug that's abused. It's sometimes used for, well, it's used for strong pain and people are, it's kind of a substitute for heroin. If they can't get their um, fix, with uh, the oxycodone or hydrocodone, they can use heroin. And that's exactly what Stephanie did. Eventually, she was arrested for possessing and trafficking heroin, and so was her brother Michael. So it takes a lot to get out of that world, a lot. In Kingman, Arizona, Vivian Padilla, Cronkite News. After prison, Stephanie recovered from her addiction. Doris's son Michael is expected to be released from a correctional tre treatment center next year. We invite you to join us for a unique event, a statewide stimulus of our Cronkite investigative documentary project called Hooked, Tracking Heroin's Hold on Arizona. The project seeks to expose our state's heroin problem, as well as provide information on addiction and recovery. It airs on this Arizona PBS channel and all channels statewide on January 13th. We'll be back with more Cronkite news. Coming up, the voting booths are lined up and the workers have been trained. Next, we'll introduce you to a woman who's made working the elections a family affair. And Congressman Ed Pastor is retiring after 23 years. We'll show you how his personality contributed to the longevity of his career. There's a typo in there. There are just a few hours left to cast your vote, but many Arizona voters choose to vote early. Cronkite News reporter Jacqueline Polito shows us just how those early ballots are counted. As polls close, thousands of ballots have already been counted. Workers started processing early ballots last Wednesday, but all of those go through a strict screening process. 
Maricopa County's recorder Helen Purcell says each ballot must be verified. We have to check every signature that they sign on the outside of their envelope when they send back their early ballot. That signature has to match their original signature on their voter registration. In that way, a counter can determine if that is the same person voting. And if it is, it's processed and tabulated. Those will be the first results that anyone will see at 8 o'clock. And then those figures stay stagnant. Then we start reporting what came in from the polling places that day. Still, a large percentage of early voters don't actually turn in their ballots before Election Day, causing delays in the results. They need to vote it, sign it, seal it, and send it. If they drop it off at a polling place, their vote is processed and verified after the election. Here, the other ballots are counted. Votes made at the polls come in after they close at 7 p.m. Then, they count the early ballots that were dropped off at the polls and any others they received in the mail. Finally, those provisional ballots are checked and counted. This process can take up to 14 days. In Phoenix, Jacqueline Polito, Cronkite News. If you didn't get a chance to mail your early ballot in, you can still turn it in tonight at your polling place before 7 p.m. Most people head to the polls to cast their votes, but some go there to work. Reporter Darby Fitzgerald tells us what it's like to work on Election Day. I am an elections nerd. I cried the first time I voted. This year, Cynthia Aragon isn't just going to be casting her vote. She's going to be working this election. It's very exciting. Um, to be able to be part of the system facilitating um, the process for people to vote. And her role in this election? A troubleshooter. And as a troubleshooter, um, you oversee uh, multiple precincts. So I have six different precincts that I oversee. Every precinct has an inspector and other poll workers. So I work with the precincts on whatever issues they might have um, to resolve them. This is Cynthia's first year working at the polls. It's also her first year as a U.S. citizen. Becoming a U.S. citizen was very important, but also with citizen it comes respons responsibilities. And I also see it as a civil duty and responsibility and a privilege. Being a poll worker is a family affair. Cynthia's son helped out with the primary election. He was a, a student poll worker at one of the, of the precincts, none of them that I had, but it was also a great experience for him. An estimated 5,000 people like Cynthia will also be working this election day. Excitement of poll workers. There are people that have been doing it for years, 20, 30 years, and they take it very seriously. They're very thorough. Cynthia sees herself continuing to work elections and encourages others to sign up as well. I would say do it, do it, do it. Darby Fitzgerald, Cronkite News. For more information about becoming a poll worker, head to recorder.maricopa.gov. Let's check in now with Katrina Arroyos for our election night forecast. Katrina, what's the weather looking like for those last minute voters? Well, weather across the state is looking beautiful. It's not too hot, not too cold. So if you haven't been down to the polls to vote, you still have time to do so. In comparison to the rest of the nation on this election day, we see St. Louis at 51, Chicago at 47, and Denver at 56. Here in the Valley on this election day, we're at 80 degrees with a 12% humidity. The reason why we're so cool is due to this moisture above Washington and Oregon. That cool air is making its way into Phoenix. But if you look here, this is an area of high pressure. This high pressure is making its way eastward into Arizona and will bring up the temperatures as early as tomorrow. We can expect temperatures to be 77 in Tucson, 80 in Phoenix, and 82 in Yuma. Over the next few days, we're going to be in the mid to upper 80s. 85 degrees on Friday, 87 degrees on Saturday, and down to 86 degrees on Sunday. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Katrina Arroyos. As you head to the ballot box today and cast your vote for the first time in 23 years, Congressman Ed Pastor's name will not be there. The congressman was kind enough to sit down with Cronkite News and reminisce about his time in office. Landmarks throughout Arizona are a testament to the work of Congressman Ed Pastor. More important, I, I think my accomplishments were I help individuals. Putting people before politics isn't only headlining Pastor's website. It's a motto he lives by. If you uh, go to a family whose dad was not deported, uh, that was a great accomplishment. Uh, uh, the thousands of people that I helped become citizens, uh, 
that's a great accomplishment. Uh, Pastor kept out of the headlines during his time in office. Congressman Pastor can be very disarming. He comes across as a gentle bear type of person, you know, the big old mustache. But I'm, some I'm say his one, welcoming yeah. personality is what got him so far. But he actually has his policy down. He knows what his objectives are, and he works very hard across the aisles to get them done. Pastor decided to end his years of hard work after taking a cue from an unexpected source. We were watching uh, Jay Leno's uh, uh, goodbye. He said, it's hard to say goodbye, but uh, it's time to say goodbye. And so I told my wife, I said, you know what, why don't we do it? On an October morning. Well, it's been a, a great, uh, great view. And Pastor's office starts to empty and his staff packs up just after his 23rd anniversary. My anniversary, yeah. Have to get a bottle of champagne or tequila. To <laughs> <laughs> just the right mix of personality and politics. I saved the taxpayers' money. I didn't go to the flat screen. What a fun guy. Now be sure to stay with Cronkite News and Arizona PBS for more election coverage tonight. Starting at 8 p.m., tune in to 8 World Digital Channel 8.3 for up-to-the-minute election results and information from watch parties across the state. And after Cronkite News, election coverage night continues on 8HD. I'm Ted Simons reminding you to be sure to tune in to Arizona Horizons Election Night Show at a special time. Join us at 10 p.m. for in-depth election results and analysis. That's tonight at 10 on Arizona Horizon. Thanks for joining us. Good night.